Cool. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Oliver. Uh, this is Deploying PHP with Ansible and Ansible Vault and Ancestrano. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the right talk. I meant to be giving you at the right time. I was a bit nervous I was going to start doing the wrong talk, given as I'm doing the one after this as well in a different room. Let me just make sure I can see all my notes and everything over here as well. Cool. Um, so this is a PHP talk. It does use Drupal as an example, but can be adapted to use pretty much anything, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so there are some Drupalisms as part of this. Um, but yeah, the tools, Ansible and Vault and Ancestrano are all uh, PHP framework and language agnostic as well. So what we'll be looking at is a, a brief Ansible crash course. So for anybody who's not used Ansible before, uh, it's a quick sort of 101. How we can use Ansible Vault to keep secrets and keep things safe. And then how to use uh, an add-on tool called Ancestrano to do deployments. So firstly, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a full stack software developer. I'm based in the UK. Um, just trying to keep an eye on my phone as well, because I'm on call this evening. So hopefully no calls come in while I'm, on, on, while I'm presenting. Uh, I work for a company called Invika. Uh, we're based in the UK and Germany, mostly, uh, where I do a lot of work with Drupal. I've been doing Drupal for about 10, 11, maybe 12 years at this point. And you can follow me on Twitter in most places as OP Davis, where I tweet a lot of hints and tips and blog posts that I write on my website on oliverdavis.uk. And I maintain a lot of open source. I do quite a bit of open source work, uh, Drupal modules, PHP libraries, uh, Twitter, um, Tailwind plugins that I'm talking about in a different talk, and some Ansible roles. Uh, so these are some quite large well known companies. I, if you're used to using, used to working in the Drupal space or the WordPress space, you'll probably be familiar with these companies. Uh, these are large platform as a service hosting providers who have optimized stacks for Drupal and PHP applications. So this is what most of my day job projects are using. This talk isn't really that applicable to this type of scenario because they have the, their own tools built in as part of the, uh, their offering. Uh, if I'm working on a client project where they maybe got their own servers, uh, or I'm doing a personal project on you know, something like DigitalOcean or a line node revolter, something where you've got a virtual or dedicated server uh, with no existing deployment steps. What I'm going to talk about is going to be a bit more applicable, I think. Um, and I've been using this approach for um, Drupal, Symfony, some static projects, uh, various different things. So firstly, what is Ansible? Uh, Ansible is an open source uh, software provisioning tool. Uh, most people still, well, most people I think consider it to be more of a software provisioning tool. So more something that sets up for setting up and configuring your server, but it also does um, application deployments as well, which is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so it's a command line tool. It's something that you install or run on your command line. Uh, it's written in Python. Uh, you don't need to know Python to use it um, unless, you need to, unless you want to write some custom modules or something. But if you're just using it 99% of the use time, you don't need to use it. Uh, it's configured with YAML. So if you're used to using Symfony or Drupal 8, you're probably going to be pretty familiar with YAML, which is one of the reasons why I like it. It's uh, Consist, it's something I'm familiar with as a consistent language. Uh, you can use it to run ad hoc commands on servers locally, such as installing software packages and performing deployment steps. And it's got a batteries included approach. So it's got modules built into it for things like managing um, SSH keys, files and directories. Uh, it's got package repositories built into it based on you know, whatever you're using whether it be a particular flavor of Linux or, or Windows or Mac OS. Um, things for stopping and starting services. So if you're installing Apache, you're going to want to start and restart Apache based on, on different points. And it's got integrations with most of those hosting providers themselves. So things like DigitalOcean and Linode and Amazon 
there are modules you can directly interface with those systems and spin up and start servers and shut down servers all through an Ansible. The pieces of Ansible are, first of all, hosts and inventories. So we need to tell Ansible where our servers are that we're going to be uh, managing and deploying to. Commands, like I've already mentioned, that we can run on, on the command line. Playbooks are groups of commands and tasks written in YAML. We'll see an example of those in a minute. Uh, roles are collections of tasks for performing a group of things. And then why Ansible? So firstly, the syntax is familiar. As I say, I do a lot of work with Drupal 8 and sometimes with Symfony. I'm very familiar with writing YAML, which is great. Uh, it's easily readable. So if I'm putting my Ansible playbooks into a repository, anybody working on that project, be it uh, an open source project or a, a company project, could open up those playbooks and see exactly what's going on. Uh, there are no server dependencies other than Python and an SSH connection. So when I've used other similar tools before, you've got to install um, software on the servers you're managing and set up a, a, a relationship and a connection between those. With Ansible, I can just, as long as I can SSH into a server and there's Python, we can do things with Ansible. It's really easy to add to an existing project. Um, I found, and it includes development modules. So as I say, there's a batteries in approach. Uh, it includes modules like Composer, if we're using Composer for our projects, which I imagine most of us are, or, or probably should be at this point. Uh, and it's idempotent. So tasks will only run when they need to run. If a directory already, directory already exists, uh, it won't try and create it again. So your playbooks are going to be a lot simpler because you don't need to check if certain things exist before trying to create them, which is nice. So hosts and inventories, we need to tell Ansible where we're going to be connecting to, what servers we're going to be managing. And there's two ways of doing this. Uh, there's an INI type syntax, which uh, is pretty commonly used. I think it's most popular of the two, uh, where we go to find groups, of servers like in this case i've got a group called web servers we're going to put in uh, an ip address here this is for a, a, a vagrant machine that i'm running on locally and uh, we can pass in some variables there as well so we can define our ssh port for ansible uh, we can supply uh, this does support even uh, wildcards and, and ranges so if i was going to input a host name here we want to support so www1 through to 5 uh, we can do that using a, a range rather than having to list everyone out individually. Uh, and also we can do dynamic posts, which we're not going to cover uh, in this talk. The second way is using YAML. Uh, again, um, I tend to prefer using YAML. Uh, most of the playbooks are written in YAML uh, as well, but it, it's nice if you're going to copy variables, for example, from playbooks to so your host file, uh, you can just drop them in straight away without having to make any changes. Um, and I think I think that's more readable compared to the, the INI syntax personally, although it is a little bit more uh, verbose. There's a few more lines in there if you, if you notice. So once Ansible knows where to connect, we need to give it a command to run. So the, the first one I tend to use is, is ping. So we can say Ansible run this command against all hosts pass it uh, an inventory file or a host file using dash i, and then dash m is the module that we want to run, so just the ping module in this case. And this is an uh, this is an example of the output that we get back. So we can see that our, we've got a success message, uh, Ansible has found Python on our server, uh, nothing has changed, and it's gonna return our ping with a pong. So we know we can connect our server and do stuff with Ansible. This is another command that we could run. Uh, this is just using the command module just to run a, a basic sort of shell command. So if we've got a Git repository on our server, we're just going to go into slash app and just run a, a Git poll. So at a, it's basic, we can just take our, Git, our shell commands, just pipe them straight into command module. That's one way of using, of using Ansible. The same command 
more or less, um, you have a slightly different format. So in this case, we're going to use the uh, git module because uh, we've got dash m git now rather than the command module. And we can use key value pairs to pass uh, parameters into that module. So our repository is, is at this GitHub URL. Um, you can look at that GitHub URL afterwards and uh, look at some uh, examples. Uh, but it's going to clone that repository into that slash app destination again. So tasks and playbooks. Uh, these are collections of sort of the commands that we just saw. So the same one, the same command I could write in, in this way. So uh, playbooks are all in YAML, which is why we've got these three dashes at the top there. Uh, first of all, we just specify our hosts. So our, our web servers group, this could be any group or it could be all. Uh, we can define some variables under vars. Uh, so we can define our Git repository there and then write tasks. So in this case, our task is update the code and we're going to run the same Git module uh, with the Git repository. We can use the double uh, curly brace mustache uh, handlebar syntax uh, to pass through our variable and again into the slash app destination and in this case, we're going to specify the version and whether to update it or not as well. So again, this is quite similar to Twig in the, in the way that it's using the double curly braces to uh, do variables as well, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, running a playbook, we do with the Ansible playbook command. Uh, we pass through the name of the playbook, the file name of the playbook, and our host file, and that will run our playbook. Roles are yet yeah, collections of tasks, variables, and handlers, which we'll see some of now. Uh, so the really just pre-packaged things that we can run. So these are some examples from uh, Jeff Gerning. Jeff writes a lot of Ansible roles. I'm a big fan of, of Jeff and his Ansible roles, in fact. Uh, and these are ones that I'm going to use to set up a very basic LAMP stack. So uh, uh, Apache, MySQL, PHP stack, and Composer. So best practice is to use a requirements file. This is a, another YAML file that lives in, in the repository. And think of this as sort of a composer JSON file. So these are the roles we're going to want to download and install and, and use. Uh, to install them, uh, they're going to be installed from Ansible's Galaxy. So think packages for Ansible and pass through the name of our requirements file after dash r and then just install and it will download them all for you. And then in our playbook we can just use roles uh, under the roles key and just list out our roles we want to use. Um, in the requirements file the order does not matter, uh, in this file the order does matter. So part of me always wants to put composer after Apache and put them in alphabetical order. Uh, that would fail because um, if it tried to run them in that order, um, C coming before P, uh, PHP wouldn't be installed when it tries to install Composer, so it would fail. So order matters in, in playbooks. Most roles, I think, or all roles probably, uh, expose a number of variables that we can use to, to configure it. So we can configure some Apache virtual hosts uh, under our vars key by defining a server name on a document root. So uh, I'm going to just say our server name is, is drancible.wip, so drancible being Drupal Ansible, uh, and our document root is in slash app and then slash web because we've got our, everything in the subdirectory with, with Drupal 8. Uh, we can configure PHP using uh, PHP version and, and extra packages. You know, these are all variables that come from uh, Jeff's awesome roles. Uh, we can configure MySQL databases and MySQL users. Uh, so those users will get created and then assigned to their databases as we set them within the, the proof key, the privilege key. Um, yeah, and that will set those up. Uh, I typically put those in, into like a provision YML playbook. We can run with uh, the Ansible playbook command like so. Uh, if we run that, this is an example of what we would see. The, the first couple of lines, what we would see. So right at the top, it's Ansible is going to gather facts about our server and try and figure out you know, what type of operating system is it running. 
And then the second task there is injecting some OS specific variables. So things like uh, Apache, the package name changes based on which distri distribution of Linux you're using. So it will figure that out for us and then run tasks like um, updating the cache there at the, at the bottom. Other stuff happens and then we get to the bottom of the file. Uh, we can see there's some handlers running here, like restarting services that it's created. Um, and we get a nice little recap right down the bottom there that says, uh, this is our group. This is how many tasks we ran, how many were okay, how many uh, had something changed and how many failed, et cetera, and how many were skipped. Then after running that, we should get something that looks a little bit like this. So we've configured, uh, installed Apache, et cetera. And if we were to go to that site now, we should see a, a default Apache page. However, uh, we've not pushed any code yet. If, so we most likely get something like this. Uh, you don't have permission to access this resource because that doesn't exist yet. Before we get there, uh, you want to take a look at Ansible Vault. So there was a, a slight issue, but this was our provision playbook we saw a few slides ago. And there's a problem there with uh, this section, MySQL user section. And you'll notice that our MySQL username and password and database name, maybe less so important twice, but nevertheless, uh, are all stored in, in plain text. So we couldn't push this to GitHub or, or <laughs> publish without everybody seeing what our password is. And that's where Ansible Vault comes in. So the Ansible Vault command, we can say create a new vault and give it the name of our vault. So again, it's just another, yeah, another YAML file that's going to contain some variables for us, but with one difference that, that we'll see. I like prefixing uh, the variables in the vault with vault underscore, and just so it's super clear when I'm reading the playbooks later on where those have come from. Uh, I do have like an intermediary playbook where I take the vault prefix off and clean up things uh, there, but we'll see an example of that in a minute. But within the vault, I like to use vault underscore just to make things really super obvious. And in here, I can put in the sensitive data. So this is, I'm, I'm able to put our, our usernames and our passwords in here. That's, that's fine. And then if I try opening that file again, this is what I would see. So we get uh, an encrypted vault. We can push this up to GitHub. Uh, I have in some of my projects, including the, the Dransible one. Uh, that's fine. That's no problem at all. And yeah, I do have this sort of intermediate playbook where I just have the vault variables and then just pass through to another one that, that doesn't have the vault in there. So um, yeah, I'm not so sure why I still do that at this point. It's a convention that I followed, um, but it does mean it's really easy to see which things are inside the vault without polluting and making things really complex inside mm -hmm. the playbook. And uh, now those things are inside the vault, we can use them in our, our playbook as we did before. So we can substitute the name and the password and the database name all with the, the variables now. And we can yeah, push this to GitHub. We don't have that problem of secrets being stored in, inside plain text. If you need to edit the vault, uh, we can just run Ansible Vault Edit, give it the name of our, our vault again, and, and it will open up uh, Vim or whatever your editor is and you'd see the uh, the plain text version again to make some edits to or add new things to. So um, site change in our playbook command now, we need to tell Ansible playbook how to decrypt our vault and use the variables that were in it. Uh, we can do that locally. Um, if you access your control machine, like your, your laptop or something, uh, we can just pass ask vault pass option at the end. It will prompt us for the password. We type it in and it will uh, it will decrypt it and, and do its thing. That's fine. Uh, if we were doing something like running this on a CI server, if we're using GitHub Actions or uh, Circle CI or, or something, we're not going to have the option to type that in uh, ourselves. So what we can do is pass through uh, the path to a, a password file. So typically I've stored the password inside an environment variable, export that to a file, run the playbook, delete the file again afterwards once it's gone. So it's only there for a short amount of time just so Ansible can use it to decrypt the things. Uh, inside the, the Dransible directory, that file is actually there, but it's just a 
test repository, so it's fine. So uh, basic deployments, just using Ansible, first of all. Uh, we can have a deploy.yaml playbook, and we can create our directory. So we, we said previously it was going to be in slash app, and we can use the file module to say that this needs to be a, a directory. And um, the ensure present is sort of implied, is the default value here. So Ansible will, will create that directory for us if it doesn't exist, uh, only if it doesn't exist. Uh, we can use synchronize to upload our application. So playbook do is a, a magic variable that Ansible gives us. That is the directory to the uh, playbook that we're running. So in this case, uh, Ansible playbook is inside a, a, an Ansible subdirectory or something. So we need to go back up one level to find where our actual application lives. And we're going to use a uh, synchronized module, which is using rsync, most likely behind the scenes. Um, to upload everything into that app directory. And then we can use Composer module to install Composer dependencies. Uh, again, we can use, uh, we specify the command we want to run, which is install in this case, and then the working directory that we want to be in before we run the command, which is our app directory. Let's see, so we have some disadvantages uh, to this really simple deployment. Firstly, there's a single point of failure. So if our site was to fail, uh, there's only one version of it on the site, our, our site is down at that point. Uh, and there's no ability to roll back, so we can't just roll back to the previous deploy if there's a problem. Sensitive data in, in plain text we've already uh, fixed using Vault. So how can we do uh, some better deployments? Uh, there's a tool called Ancestrano, which are just two uh, two more Ansible roles that we can download from Galaxy and install into our project. Uh, these are, are ports of an, another tool called Capistrano, which is written in Ruby and gives uh, a more opinionated approach to deployments using some conventions like uh, multiple release directories, etc. that we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, so first of all, it's going to put each release into its own directory um, based on you know, the timestamp of the deploy. Uh, we can run, uh, sorry, we can share paths and files between deploys. So for, for Drupal, that's going to be our, our site's default files directory where our, our user uploaded assets go. And for Symfony, it's going to be like our var cache directory and our var log directory. Uh, everything's really customizable, but we'll see examples of in a minute. Uh, there are different deployment strategies, so we can deploy from Git, we can deploy from SVN, we can use rsync, etc. Uh, it supports multi-stage environments, so if you've got a, a staging site and a dev site and a, a production site, uh, it supports that as well. And there's the ability to prune old releases, so we can say that we only want to keep the last five releases, the last three releases or ten releases, depending on your project. And because we've got multiple directories, multiple releases, we can roll back if we need to. If there's a problem, we can roll back to the last release. So how do we add them? Uh, we just add them into our requirements file. So where we had Apache, PHP, et cetera, before, we can just add uh, ancestrano.deploy and .rollback into our requirements file. Uh, we can install them in the same way we saw before. And now in the deploy playbook, we can include our role. That's just trying to apply. Uh, being a role, uh, it offers some variables we can configure. So as I say, it's, uh, it's multiple deployment strategies. So we're going to deploy via Git again. Uh, we're going to tell it where to deploy to. So that's our deployment directory. So that's our slash app directory. Uh, which branch are we going to deploy from? In this case, it's still going to be going to be master and, and the same repository as well. And to run the deploy, we run the Ansible playbook command again um, using the, the deploy playbook this time. So nothing, nothing really has changed there. And we'll see again that Ansatrano is running um, on our servers. It's going to make sure that base path exists, so that slash app directory is, is there. It's going to make sure the releases folder and, and the shared folders are there. Uh, if you want to change these, you can. Um, I've not needed to uh, before. Uh, it's going to make sure that our shared path exists, so our sites directory, our files directory in, in this case, it's there. And it's going to run um, 
all the steps in between, so updating our file permissions, there's some custom stuff happening in the middle that we'll see in a minute. Uh, it's going to clean up the old releases if we've told it to, to prune them. And it will send some stats if you've told it, unless you've told it not to. So uh, back on the home page, it shows how many deploys there have been. Um, yeah, and again, we got a little uh, summary at the bottom. So on, on our server, inside our Vagrant box, this is, this is what we see. Uh, if we go into the app directory and just run a, an ls minus l to show uh, all the output there, we'll see a, a slightly different, we don't see our Drupal site here, we see uh, the three directories or the, the two directories that the Ansys runner was set up for us. So the releases directory is where the releases live, uh, the shared directory is where the shared stuff lives, and current is a, a sim link to the, the active release. So that's where we'd push our um, Apache virtual host to, our Nginx virtual host to, would be to um, the current current directory. Uh, inside releases, uh, we'll see our different directories there. So they're all generated automatically based on the timestamp of, of when that deploy was run. So these ones were in July 2019. I made these slides. And if you want to roll back, we can we can have a separate rollback playbook. And all we need to do is just include the rollback role and the path to deploy to or, or roll back into. Um, and it will go back to the last release on its own, which is awesome. So I said Ancestrano is really customizable and it offers some built hooks that we can use to configure, configure it. So there are five steps. So setup. Uh, update code, symlink shared, symlink and cleanup, and then both of the each one has before and after, and we could hook into each of them. So update code is when we're pulling down our new code through Git or whatever. Uh, shared symlink is when uh, maybe our, if our settings or PHP is inside the, the shared directory, uh, once it's symlinked that in, then we can hook there. Uh, the main symlink is when the current site uh, the current sim link is is linked updated so that's essentially when our site is live at that point and then cleanup is, is the printing the releases etc so um yeah in our deploy playbook we can use some special variables to hook into these so as i say each one has before and after so in this case we can say after we after the sim link shared step has run uh, we're going to want to include this additional playbook. Uh, we could do the same thing for after the symlink file as, as after the symlink has been updated and after the code update has been updated as well. Uh, it does pose an interesting problem though. Uh, how do we know where things are going to be? If, if the releases are generated on the names, if the directories are generated when the release is run, how do we know what the direct the name is going to be to get to our uh, application and our tools uh, and Ancestrano gives us a, a Ancestrano release path variable that we can use to find that out so that's always going to be relevant and applicable to each release so here are some examples of things we could do uh, so after we've updated our code we've pulled down our latest Drupal site or Symfony app or whatever we're going to want to run Composer install to install our dependencies uh, after the symlink has been shared, so if our settings.php is, is symlinked, uh, then we can run our database updates. Uh, this is, you know, if it's a, a Drupal website, we're going to want to run a database updates. Uh, and after our symlink is done, the site is live, we're going to want to rebuild the cache to make sure that everything's live and everybody can see the new stuff. Uh, after that, we should see yeah, something like this. So this is the screenshot I took before DrupalCon Amsterdam, apparently. But it's a website. Awesome. So managing data across deployments, we sort of touched on this already. Uh, Ancestrano does give us uh, a shared paths variable that we can use, and within that we can say share these directories, send these directories in. So if we go into the files directory, uh, into the server, we can go into um, app shared this time. And then the rest of the directory structure is mirrored, so it follows the same sort of subdirectory structure. And inside here, we can see our normal uh, Drupal file system with you know, 
empty Drupal file system with just some uh, compressed CSS and PHP and things like that. However, if we go into the uh, app current directory, so the live version of this application, and go into the site's default directory, we'll see that files is, is a symlink, and it goes back up, uh, however many directories there, uh, back into shared, and then into our files directory again. So every release, our files are persisted across each release. So we're not gonna need every to re-upload all the files on it on every deploy, because that would be silly. Again, if you're doing uh, Symphony, you're going to want to keep up, keep your logs uh, in this directory as well, so that your, your logs are persist across deploys uh, and our cache as well. Uh, in this case, settings to a PHP is not symlinked. Um, we'll talk about that next. So I typically generate the settings files per deployment. Uh, I did start off symlinking them, but I've started taking a slightly different approach. Uh, and the reason for that is I'm going to want to store these database values inside our vault that we saw earlier. So I'm going to specify the name, user, username, password, and, and the, the hash sort for Drupal inside the vault. Uh, in the main, in the, the non-vault variables file, we can uh, assign those to the, the vault, non-vault variable names. And what I've started doing recently is adding a, a Drupal settings variable so I've uh, started writing, a, or I've written a role that's now available in Ansible Galaxy. It wasn't the last time that I gave this talk. Uh, we can include that and everything underneath the Drupal settings key will get used to generate our settings file. So uh, this works for multi-site environments. I've got a few projects that are, that are multi-site. So if uh, we specify that where our Drupal root is, so app web, and then sites is a is an array is, is a list so we can specify multiple sites and their name so which directory name they're in so sites default so the name is default and then our settings for our databases and our hash and our config directory because it's Drupal 8 and we're going to use those variables from the vault inside this file and this role will take these variables and build a settings file for us uh, it does this using a, another feature of, of Ansible called templates. Uh, so again, this is very familiar to Twig. If people are used to seeing Twig, they'll be uh, familiar with, with this. It's, this is uh, the Ginger2 syntax, so it's so very similar to, to Twig. Uh, we start by saying this is Ansible managed, so it's just a, a little placeholder. So if you do open up this file on a server, you'll see that it's managed by Ansible. And then we're going to do some looping over those values and, and building up our databases values there. Like that. Um, these are just a couple of tasks inside that, that role. So first of all, we're going to make sure that the directory exists. So we've given uh, each directory a, a site name, sort of a machine name, if you will. And it's going to make sure that that sort of subdirectory of that project exists. So we've got somewhere to put in the file and then it's going to create the file using a um, template module to take that Ginger2 file that we just saw or saw part of, copy across all the variables, do some more looping and, and spit out our, our file at the end. Uh, as I said, it does support multiple environments, so dev, test, prod, etc. Um, this is the way I've been approaching it. Um, I don't know if there's a, a best practice example, but this is the way that works for me. Uh, so I can set up multiple databases, so one for production, one for staging, and I'm going to have multiple MySQL users, again, one for production, one for staging, and we're going to use the uh, applicable database password for live or staging, depending. Uh, I have separate inventory files, so I've got one for live, and the only real sort of difference here is um, the, the deploy path and the git branch. So um, the master site, the live site is in a slash app, and we're going to be using the master branch in this, in this example, and then passing through our, our Drupal specific variables. And for staging, we have a, a different staging, different inventory file, different YAML file uh, with a different deploy path. So staging goes into app test, and then we're going to be using them. Um, develop branch for this if we're doing a, a git flow type approach. Um, if I want to deploy the staging, then I'm just going to run uh, the deploy playbook with the staging inventory file. 
and then um, if I'm going to want to do it live, or it's production, I'm going to want to just run the use the the live file. So um, yeah, that's yeah, how I've been approaching multi-state environments. Uh, I think I've got time for a little quick little quick demo before we uh, open this up to questions. So let's see if we can uh, get this running. So again, we're using, using um, VirtualBox and Vagrant for this. So hopefully we can see if I put Chrome and not TweetDeck, then we should be able to see Transform. So this is the uh, this is the site that we've built. Uh, if I go to overdays.uk slash transible, we should be able to see the GitHub repository. Yeah, there we go. So this is the GitHub repository, uh, the public GitHub repository for this project. And we'll see that we have a configuration directory and we have some Ansible playbooks and a configuration file. So I can open this up in Sublime and not look at my tweet, draft tweet. Uh, we do have a configuration file with some configuration file. We've not talked about configuration files so far, but we're going to specify an inventory file, uh, our private key because we're using Vagrant, uh, our remote user is Vagrant. Uh, we're going to use YAML callback so we get a slightly better output and our vault password file is defined here as well. So I typically like putting this into tools, as I have uh, recently. So tools and small uh, vault password is just in vault password. And the vault password is transable. So um, yeah, that's fine. that's fine. It's just a it's just an example anyway. Uh, so we do have a requirements file. We have um, the Ancestrana roles. We have Jeff's roles, and we have my Drupal settings file at the bottom. Uh, we have a main playbook, which is going to run provision and then deploy at the same time, uh, if you want to do that. Uh, provision is just going to set up our LAM stack again, our composer. Uh, I typically put provision separate vaults uh, at the beginning here, then some generic variables, and then uh, the non-vault ones separately. So. And then we've got the tasks there for actually creating our database. Uh, so we look at the vault quickly. The vault is encrypted. We can't see what's in the vault, uh, but we do have uh, our non-vault variables in here. So we're going to be using yeah, PHP 7.4, etc., etc. Thanks, Jeff. These awesome roles. <laughs> um, deploy again. We're going to use Ancestrano deploy. Pull in our, our variables. So we've got some provision variables that we need and some deploy variables. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using rsync rather than git. Uh, deploy from is, is just two levels up from where we are. Uh, we're going to keep five releases uh, in this case. Run these Ancestrano playbook uh, um, hooks, which we can see these live inside the de deploy directory. Uh, so we could, um, let's see, uh, install Drupal every time. So if this is a, a dev or a staging or a, any sort of pre production site, we can, might want to just reinstall Drupal uh, fresh every time just to make sure you've not got any. Little weird things going on there. Uh, after we've got a symlink, we can update some permissions, just make sure everything's writable. After we've updated our code, we're going to want to run our composer update and generate our settings file. So interestingly, we can use include role to just include the role at, at that point in, in the playbook. So if we were to call it in uh, here, it would run it right at the beginning, which is, is what we want. So we're using include role to actually uh, run that at that specific point in, in the playbook. Uh, rollback again is what we've seen. It's got a rollback role and something else and um, our variables and then our, our path. So I've already run the provision script as, as we can see uh, if I go back to the site here. So provisioning takes a little while, particularly if you're running it for the first time. Um, so I've already run that, which is why we can see a site. Uh, if I did want to run it again, we could just say uh, provision, provision, provision .yaml, and that would rerun the provision. Um, deploy is going to rerun the deploy. Uh, so the bottom half of this screen is my it's my laptop. The top half is is inside Vagrant. So if I look inside the app directory, we have our uh, releases. So we have our shared directory and our current 
directory is sim linking to uh, this release right here. So this is a test that I was doing <laughs> earlier on today. Uh, so look inside our release directory, we have five releases because we've told it to run to, to prune five releases. Um, inside shared, we have uh, our web directory and our files directory, which it's been sim linked in. Uh, if we go back into current web sites default, we can see our, our files directory. So this is being sim linked into that directory that we already saw. Uh, let's see if we can have a look at the web directory sites default settings. So this is our generated settings file. Uh, so we've got our little Ansible manage comment right at the top. And it's going to use some, some Drupal variables. Everything is called Drupal right now uh, that come out of our vault. There's our, our hash setting, our hash salt value, our configuration directory, our trusted host. So our, our site is available at, at Jansible, uh, but nothing else. And then that's all generated by uh, the deploy variables. Yeah, it's this set here. So these are our Drupal settings that's using. Uh, let's see what we can, what can we change. So at the moment, it's going to install Drupal on every deploy, which is going to take some time. Uh, obviously, we don't want to be doing that on production either. So we can set this to be false in this case. And I think in here, yeah, we're saying only run this when Drupal install is, is true. So we can skip that by making that false. Uh, we can change maybe the number of releases. So if we look up Solano, keep, I think it's keep releases. Just double check that. See how we're doing for time. Cool, you good. Keep releases is yeah zero by default. It will keep everything. So maybe we want to keep uh, maybe three uh, at this point. And there's another option I can pass through to this Drupal settings array, which is extra parameters. Let's see if I can type parameters. And maybe let's take a look at Drupal default settings. Let's see what we can override. I think maybe the site name is something we can override in the settings of PHP. And the reason why I like doing this is that sometimes there are changes to the settings of PHP that I want to make. There we go, that's what I'm looking for. Config system site name. Uh, so this is set in our configuration directory in system site. So yeah, our name is Jansible right now. We can override it if we want to by adding this to the bottom. And let's make this CMS for the... And this should get added to the bottom of our generated settings file. Uh, let's just double check everything in here. So we've got our releases, we have five releases. Awesome. And I've killed my TX pain. Nice. Cool. So that's for another, another deploy. This shouldn't take too long because I've already done one. The first deploy is going to take a few minutes, particularly because of Composer and having to install everything. Uh, we've done it once, which so shouldn't take too long this time. And we should see um, a couple of changes. Come on, Composer. There we go. So very quickly, it was generating our settings file. I saw that there. It's going to skip install Drupal because we set that to false. Uh, it's now updating the directory permissions. And that was doing our cleanup steps. So. Yeah, we can see how 13 things have changed. So back to our releases again, we've now only got 
three releases because that's what we changed it to. Uh, let's see again, our current sim link has now been updated to the, the right time. So it's uh, 17, 1745, so quarter to six PM in the UK. And if we go back to Transform, hopefully our site name should now change as well, which it did. So just a really quick example of something that we might want to change on a, on a per deployment basis using that role. Uh, as I said, this is available on, on GitHub if people want to check this out afterwards uh, with some instructions of how to how to run it and you know, what you should see at every, every sort of step. Um, okay, let's just go back to the slides. Find the slides. Where are we? Okay, so demo is done. Cool. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, again, that that URL takes you to the to that GitHub repo that we just saw. And uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter and other places. That uh, yeah. So, so don't have any sort of. Uh, chat for questions or do people want to unmute and ask questions? I can hear typing, so I'm hitting somebody's. Let's get some. I don't see any questions. Okay, there's no questions, then we'll um, feel free if you do think of anything later on, feel free to ping me in Slack uh, or uh, grab me on Twitter afterwards or anything repo specific, feel free to make issues and PRs on, on those, that'd be, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, okay, we'll finish a couple of minutes earlier then in that case. Oh, Thank you, Oliver. Good.